70% of millennials plan to vote for socialist candidates. Squala's war and this tribal dance, why 100% of non-millennials reach for the facepalm emoji. I'm Dr. Duke, she's Katie, and this is The Dr. Duke Show. Hello everyone, and welcome to The Dr. Duke Show, the only program that keeps you educated on the craziness impacting K-12 classrooms and college campuses around the world. Today, today we talk about a new survey that finds a majority of Democrat college students want their peers punished for offensive Halloween costumes. Nice to know that 18-year-olds have become your grandma, get off my lawn types, right? Plus, Princeton Theological Seminary, all those words seem contradictory to me, pledges to pay $27 million in reparations for slavery, and the Students Black Student Association says that's not nearly enough. But we begin with a disturbing report that finds that 70% of millennials now plan to vote for socialist politicians. This comes from the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, right? A, a group dedicated to reminding Americans of the cost of dabbling with socialism and these kind of uh, uh, salon intellectual universities that, that deal in this kind of historical revisionism and whitewashing the history of socialism. The Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation released its fourth annual report on U.S. attitudes towards socialism, communism, and collectivism. And, and the numbers probably sh shouldn't surprise us. This year's study showed increased support for communism up to 36% among millennials, 36% among millennials. Uh, compared to 2018, opinions of capitalism took a steep decline from 2018 to 2019, with only one in two millennials, ages 23 to 38, and Gen Z agers, 16 to 22, only one in two, 50%, have a favorable opinion of capitalism. Socialism's favorability decreased markedly from 2018 among all generations except for millennials and the silent generation, which is 74 plus. I would say the silent generation, you know, 74 plus, that's Bernie. That's, that's Biden. <laughs> that's the entire that's, Democrat that, party. Basically, that I was, I was wondering because I took a look at that stat and I said, well, okay, millennials, absolutely. And silent generation, I, I had to stop and then I was like, oh, Bernie. Would that they were. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so what's interesting for me to look at is, is obviously when you take a look at the favorability with the capitalism and then obviously with the, the communism. And in just a couple years time, because it ticked up the communism with the millennials, 8% from just last year. You do that every year. This is going to be completely inverted within five years. And I got news for you, America. The attempt to reform socialism and make it mainstream has already occurred. It's not happening. It's over. They've done it. Now they're going to communism, right? Karl Marx once said, and Karl Marx is the founder of all this big mess, Karl Marx made the argument that socialism is the path to communism, that socialism is not a middle road, that democratic socialism is going to be some wonderful hybrid between mm -hmm. free markets and moderate social control. No. Socialism, Marx said, mainstreaming socialism, getting people to buy into socialism is merely a necessary step on the inevitable road to communism. And what this survey tells us, that it's now they've turned to communism, right? That the, the, the progressive argument has always been, well, communism, we agree with you, like abortions, right? We want them rare and safe. Yeah. Communism has is, is always been kind of over the pale. We just want a progressive form of socialism. Mm. And now you see that among millennials and younger generations, the rehabilitation of actual communism follows in the wake that now socialism has become a real legitimate thing in this country. It is the gateway drug. It is. It is. And Marianne Smith, who's the executive director of the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, summed this up nicely. She said, the historical amnesia about the dangers of communism and socialism is on full display in this year's report. When we don't educate our youngest generations about the historical truth of 100 million victims murdered at the hands of communist regimes over the past century, we shouldn't be surprised at their willingness to embrace Marxist ideas. We need to redouble our efforts to educate America's youth about the history of communist regimes and the dangers of socialism today. Yeah, and that's uh, a, w a very important word of warning from a woman and an organization that knows, alas... Uh, you're not going to get, it's the school's job to do it. And our schools from kindergarten all the way through graduate programs and universities are already overtly socialist. They're owning their socialism and they're agitating now for the next step, which is communism. It's a very grim story. And that makes sense as to why then when you take a look at something as simple as mm, Halloween costumes, we have 71% of at least the Democrat students on the college campuses demanding that their peers be punished because 
Halloween costumes are offensive. They had a College Pulse survey of 1,500 students, and they put the question to them, are highly offensive Halloween costumes, and this is where they kind of teetered Highly it. offensive, yeah, highly, right. Such as blackface, they just put that one out mm-hmm. there, such as blackface, a protected form of speech on campus, or should students who wear them be punished? When you phrase it like that, you get these kids thinking about blackface. Oh, that's highly offensive. 71% of students who identify as being Democrats think that their peers should be punished for wearing such a costume. 18% of those who identify as Republicans say they should be punished. And 47% of independents say punishment. Yeah, so almost half the independents think we should punish this. And notice that it was 70% of millennials who plan to vote for socialist candidates, right? And now you've got 71% of Democrat students who want what they consider to be offensive costumes punished. Now, again, I, I consider myself a bit of a Luddite here. I mean, the idea that you slap white makeup on your face if you're black or black ma- makeup on your face if you're white, it seems to me that this is um, a, a really, really overblown problem. I mean, we saw as long as you're the Democrat governor of, New, of Virginia, right, we're willing to ignore it. Uh, it's highly selective in their outrage. We've seen late night comedians, what, Kimmel and... Um, uh, Kimmel and, for uh, sure has done it. Who's the... Uh, Fallon, they both have in in the last 10, 15 years, they have put Sarah Silverman, Ah. right? And so they've all done it. And somehow they don't seem to these, all these Democrat operatives and progressives, they don't feel the same wrath that you and I might for daring to put blackface on. But as you pointed out, or you you alluded to, Katie, uh, highly offensive costumes. It doesn't just mean blackface, right? Wearing a kimono if you're white, wearing a sombrero if you're white. Let's be very clear. Anything if you're white. Any, uh, any costume. If you're white, any costume. anything that has any other cultural sensitivity to attached to it is going to be now hostile. Now, again, the question becomes this. Uh, what happens if, if a Mexican wears a kimono? Or what happens if an Asian wears a sombrero? Will there be the same level of outrage? Because that's never happened. We never seem to get that. It, it depends. It comes down to the class of the hierarchy ranking. Mm, yeah, so, so who who's are, the biggest who are amongst you? Yeah, exactly. Uh, for the rest of the survey results, they did the breakdowns. We'll just go through them very quickly. Men were less offended than women, which makes Surprise. sense. Surprise. Saying only six, six, only 38% of men said you should be punished, but 65% of women. I like this. 76% of non-binary <laughs> say they should be punished. Uh, broken down by race, 72% of the black students and 61% of the two or more races students said punishment should be given out. And with religion, 74% of Muslim students, 68% of Jewish, and then going all the way down to the bottom, 45% of Christian and 37% of Protestant. These are all saying they should be punished for these right. highly offensive, which we don't well, know what again, that means, Halloween costumes. And you know what just absolutely slays me is when you have men dressing as women, when you have adult men dressing in th- appropriating female wardrobes, this is considered the height of progressivism, isn't it? Uh, we're going to go talk about the National Review editor, Rich Lowry. He has a book coming out called The Case for Nationalism. So he decided that he was going to put an ad in the New York University student newspaper called the Washington Square News. <laughs> Loser, L7 Weenie, Square <laughs> News. Anyway, he wanted to promote the book because he's also going to be—he was going to be doing a lecture by the same name, and so he placed this ad in the student newspaper. Everything seemed hunky dory, and then the editor in chief of that newspaper, Sakshi Venkatraman. I think that's how you say the name, put out a statement explaining why she chose at the last second to cancel the ad. Mm. She said, on Sunday night during our weekly print production of the paper, I decided to pull the ad from the issue. The ad's pro-nationalist message does not align with the values of our paper, and after much thought, it was my decision to cancel it. The word nationalism, because it's in the case for nationalism, that's the book's title, as it exists in today's political lexicon, connotates xenophobia and white supremacy, and printing it in large letters on the back of our paper would have marginalized people of color on our campus and our staff. I prioritized the sensibilities 
and trust of our audience they, over the ad revenue. And I stand by my decision. They repeat these progressive <laughs> talking, this alphabet soup of progressive g- of na- nonsense. They repeat the same way the Nazis did. They, the same way, I don't mean to do the Godwin's Law thing here, but what they're doing is they're, they're, they're repeating these phrases that have come to mean nothing. Mm-hmm. And we looked at the first story for today where communism is being rehabilitated. Though They've already successfully reclaimed socialism and normatized it. Now they're reclaiming claiming communism and they're doing the exact opposite with nationalism, right? And so nationalism is simply nothing more than the belief that uh, nations matter. I mean, I get that in the same way you could argue, right, that communism shouldn't be used. Because while there might be, according to the left, some beneficial communists, the word has been tainted by 100 million dead people. But no, they never say that. They go busily going about rehabilitating communism. With nationalism, the fact that some organizations have uh, co-opted the word nationalist for racist reasons, that means the whole spectrum of of nationalism has to be disavowed. And Lowry's book is very sane. And so he's basically arguing that nationalism also means basically what Donald Trump has said, right? That uh, I'm the elected president of the United States. I am not the president of the United Nations. United Nations. We have nations for a reason. Nation states are useful. Globalism is a bad thing. And yet you see these people, and, and they always seem to have immigrant names, don't they? I mean, that's the other thing that you get about this. You run to this country, or your family ran to this country to get away from something, to get away from the ideals of your country or your place. And then you, even if you're second or third generation, here you are in America, and all of a sudden, that which beckoned your families here, all of our families were beckoned here by this call. Now that's a bad thing, right? We, we and my family and my ancestors, we all came rushing to this country to take advantage of what it has to happen and not of what it has to offer. And now that we've taken advantage of it, we're going to shut down the whole idea of the nation, right? We're going to completely shut that down. And I love when things like this happen where this is like poetry in motion because Lowry decided he's the editor of the National Review. He has his own platform where he can respond to what this student did. And so he says, this is exactly the point of my book. Like, it it couldn't have been put out any better. But he said, the point of the book is to basically look at these pre- conceptions about nationalism and he said that this ad is ruled out of bounds it goes precisely to the point i make in my book the greatest killer of the 20th century was transnational ideology especially communism yep. but i'm sure i could take out an ad for a laudatory talk about karl marx or socialism and no one would bet an eyelash right. in fact would welcome it but if you want to say hey alexander hamilton arguably the greatest american nationalist had a point or you say, you know, nationalism has been part of the American mainstream from the time of the American Revolution onward. Or even if you want to say, gee, it's been a very good thing that we live in a world of sovereign nation states. No one wants to hear that. No, and again, this what this goes back to is we're de- in the same way that we are rehabilitating communism, collectivism, socialism, Marxism, anything that would suggest anti-globalism that's now being branded xenophobic and racist. So even the conversation, why? And he, I, love the, I love his use of the word transnational <laughs> ideology, right? Those ideologies that seek to erase nations in the name of a collective universal globalist government. Now to simply argue against transnational globalism makes you a bigot, a xenophobe, and you got punk kids ed- editing newspapers on college campuses who've decided that in the name of sensitivity, right, we're going to destroy, we're going to completely eliminate the possibility of talking about nationalism on college campuses at all. A little advice to anyone out there who's thinking of wanting to work for a newspaper someday. Don't be a journalist major, because I guarantee you this person was. Uh, so if you're going to work for a newspaper, have something outside as your major, and then just write at the paper. That's the best way to do right, it. That would be the best way to do it, assuming that anybody will publish what you do. That's a good point. All right. So Princeton Theological Seminary recently pledged, again, $27 million of its own endowment to pay reparations for the school's historic ties to slavery, which are not really that tied. And and Katie, what did the Black Student Association, what do you think, how did the the Black Student Association reply when $27 million was being handed to them, basically, for for acts of slavery that they never experienced? Were they grateful? Did they they herald Princeton as as glorious Princeton Seminary? What'd they do? They said, you know what? It's, It's a great start. 
but it's not it's nearly just not enough. enough. It's just not enough. And now Princeton Theological Seminary finds out what the bottom line of reparations is. And here's my confusion on this whole thing is this is the Princeton Seminary. It has 360 students. Mm -hmm. They have an association of black seminarians at the Princeton Theological Seminary. Okay, how how many students is even in that group? Of the 360 Six, students, the whole right, wow, you got my high figure. school, my little town high school yeah, is no, actually more than bigger. 20, 25 okay. percent max. So, right. so you have 27 million already going to it, and now they're saying that another 120 million, million dollars. dollars must be given. To what? To, to what? change exactly. the name of buildings, to, re, to, to redesign Princeton Theological Seminary curriculum, to account for our racist history. It, See, <laughs> no good deed goes unpunished here. Not only are you going to pay us this money, you're going to give us five times what we've asked for, or you're still racist. And I guarantee you, if you cough up the $127 million, you're still going to be racist. And what you're going to do is you're going to change your curriculum to remind every theological student for the next thousand years how racist you are. And and then it, t down the road, it's not going to have been enough, right? Now that you get all those changes, that is just the beginning of what we have to do. And I'm going to remind you one more time that these, this seminary and their ties to slavery was not that they had any, slaves. ever owned any slaves. They never had any slave labor to build the buildings, no. nothing. The closest thing they said they had is that they had taken money from some donors and invested in banks that had profit from let slavery, this sink which is in. Like I mean, my seven God. degrees of Kevin exactly. Bacon connection, Kev right? <laughs> and maybe instead of Kevin Bacon, Bacon we'll call this Red Fox, right? Seven, seven Red degrees Fox. of Red Fox to racial oppression. I'm telling you, look at where this money is going: funding 30 scholarships for and five doctoral fellowships for descendants of slaves, or. Mm -hmm. Students from underrepresented oh, groups, right? I think the or will be used that, heavily. That, exactly. I mean, so your your great great grandfather at this point was a slave, which means you're suffering to the degree that we have to give you a free education. And if we can't even find people like you because they're going away quickly, will we, any yep. underrepresented group, right? Hiring a new professor focused on African American life, along with a full time director of a brand new center for Black Church Studies. Right, so you you you, you can see this is this is nothing more than uh, a a tectonic reorganization of what would be a Christian seminary into a progressive social justice African militant group that I mean may have some vague ties to Christianity, but it's all about the wokeness is what it's about. Well, I'm fully woke now, so make sure, as always, to please share this episode and become woke as well. Subscribe to the free audio podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, and everywhere else. Just visit drdukeshow.com and subscribe for free. And that's it for us today. If you like the show, please consider supporting it by signing up for our Patriot Club. A couple times a year, we will send you some really good tchotchkes for $25 a month, and all that money goes to keep the lights on and Chick-fil-A on the table. Visit thedrdukeshow.com to get started. We'll be back again Monday at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for The Freedom Project. I'm Dr. Duke. She's Katie. And until next time, stay educated, my friends. <laughs>